Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel. Bex here today to talk about my fiction TBR, TBR meaning to be read, all the books I physically own that I need to read. And I did a version of this video a little bit ago that was strictly my nonfiction TBR, so I will link that if you're interested in seeing those books. But this one's going to be focusing on the bit of middle grade and YA that I do have, and then a lot of just adult fiction that has been sitting on my shelves some for quite some time. I have all of the books stacked out here in front of me. I counted there's 54 of them which is a bit more than my nonfiction, which I suppose kind of makes sense because I do feel like I churn through my nonfiction a bit faster because it's usually more what I want to read. Of the 54 books, seven of them are technically rereads, books that I read when I was in elementary school and in high school and I really want to read them again but but most of these are brand new to me, so let's get going. Starting with my rereads pile, I have an entry in the Royal Diaries series. This is Kailani, the People's Princess. This is about a Hawaiian princess in 1889, and these books are uh, informative without getting too deep into it. It's a great starter kind of thing for people who are in that sort of elementary, middle school age group. I definitely remember grabbing this one from the library a long time ago, and I've been slowly collecting these books as I've seen them in thrift stores. And so this is one that I haven't reread, but really want to. I then have four books from the Chronicles of Narnia that I haven't got to yet. These covers are gonna be super shiny. Uh, so I've reread Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, and The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and actually watched the more recent film adaptations of them. So. I have book to movie comparison videos, which I can link. You can check those out if you're interested. But these four are the ones that don't have a movie companion, and I've been reading them in publication order. So I think the next one I technically have to read what is six chronologically, but it's The Silver Chair, because this one has Eustace in it again, their cousin Eustace who shows up in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And yeah, you can see, very shiny, very shiny. So I have The Silver Chair. And then if we just go back to the actual, you know, one, three, and seven on the spines here, we have the magician's nephew, we have the horse and his boy, and then the last battle. I have no recollection of what happens in these. I read them originally when I was nine or ten, uh, so it, it's not sticking in my brain anymore. The other, the plot lines of the other ones stuck with me a bit more just because I've seen the movies a bunch. So these will be kind of fun to reread just because I won't really have any idea what's going to happen in them. And the final collection of books that I need to reread is the Uglies series by Scott Westerfeld. So I read uh, Uglies and Pretties, which is the first two books in the series when I was in high school. I remember borrowing those from the library. And then there's also specials and extras in this series, which I never read, but I bought this box set because I really like the simplistic look of it. I wanted to reread these, or at least the first one, before the TV show was released, but I haven't really seen anything recently about where that is in terms of the production timeline, so. But I do really want to reread the first two and just finish the entire series because it's a dystopian series about people being able to like get their faces redone when they get to be a certain age, and I just found it very fascinating at the time. That's my pile of books that I've read before more or less. And then I have a little pile of my middle grade YA. So I wanted to, I figured I could just group those together too. So the first one of these is Wondersmith, The Calling of Morgan Crow by Jessica Townsend. This is the second book in the Nevermore series. I read the first one two years ago now. It's been a bit, it's been a bit. Uh, but I still definitely remember the storyline of this girl being uh, kind of mistreated by her family and then being whisked off to a magical world where she has to try and join the wondrous society and these trials that they have to go through. And it was fun, uh, definitely enjoyable enough for me to get the next book and continue on in the series. I then have two more Royal Diaries books, one of which I definitely don't have any memory of ever picking up, which is The Lady of Chiao Ku, Warrior of the South. This takes place in Southern China in AD 531. And this is a special edition, so it's a, it's a bigger one of the book. This one is, they actually do have individual authors, but they don't put them on the front. This one's by Lawrence Yep, who I believe is a pretty notable author in his own right. So maybe that's why this is a special edition. And then the other one, which I feel like I probably read, but I don't have it marked on Goodreads and I don't have any specific memories 
things from it. This is the Marie Antoinette book and it's uh, Princess of Versailles is the subtitle and this is Austria France 1769 so possibly have read this one before but that's fine. And then I have two books that have been on my shelves for a really long time. I got sent these by the publisher back in like 2014. The first one in the series is The Glass Sentence and the second one is The Golden Specific. They're both by S.E. Grove obviously and I tried to read The Glass Sentence back in the day and just could not get into it but it still sounds like something I really enjoy. It's a world where there's some sort of great shift and the continents are all still there but each continent exists in a different time period. So one of them could be in the Middle Ages, one of them could be in the 1700s and it just as you travel between them it's like you're time jumping almost. So the concept is super cool. I just ugh, ever I tried them and I tried the one, couldn't get into it and then ever since then I've just been really hesitant to pick them up again. I really do feel like it was just me not being in the mood in that moment though. This one has really been pulling at me lately to pick up. That is The Queen of the Tearling by Erica Johansson. This series got a ton of buzz back in the day. I believe it is a trilogy and I've heard that as you go on people kind of like them less and less but people really loved the first book. It is YA as far as I know but not like too heavy of a YA, maybe more of a YA adult hybrid and yeah, we've got a woman who's the rightful queen and that's pretty much all I know from it. But I still am very interested in checking this one out, especially recently because I have been getting this pulled kind of try to get into fantasy again. Something that I haven't really been into since I was in like high school or younger. And then I have the second book in the Diviners trilogy. The cover is super dirty. Lair of Dreams is massive. I got this uh, on sale from Chapters back before chapters became indigo <laughs> and uh, yeah so I read the first book of this and really enjoyed it. I have enjoyed Libra Brace books in the past. This one takes place in the 1920s. There's sort of occult creepiness stuff going on but there is a magical element to it and I know that when I read this book I'm gonna have to reread the first one again because it has been way too long uh, and I really enjoyed the main character in it and kind of how like spunky and uh, she she got herself into trouble. She had a very loud mouth, but in a very entertaining way. And uh, yeah, I want to see where this one goes, but I just, this book, this edition is so massive. I feel like I just need nicer editions that, that would make me want to read the book more. We're now moving on to my five stacks of adult fiction books. I did not group these by specific genre. I figured it wasn't worth the effort because I could be wrong in some of my assumptions. So the first book is Feel the Burn, a Bernie Sanders mystery by Andrew. It looks like it's spelled Schaffer. It could be Schaefer. So Schaefer Schaffer, not totally sure. This is a recent acquisition. Les got me this because she got herself a copy as well and we want to buddy read this. But it is literally what it says. It's a Bernie Sanders mystery and he is uh, my rep. Even though I live in Canada, I can still vote in the US because I am a US citizen and because I grew up in Vermont, I get to vote for Bernie Sanders and I have voted for him before. And you know, he's <laughs> he's got, he, he pops up on, you know, the pop culture circuit every once in a while for something interesting that he's done. And so I thought it would be fun and Les thought it would be fun to read this book. I then have a book that my sister told me I need to read, My Year of Meats by Ruth Elozeki. Ruth Elozeki's been uh, kind of popular recently for some other books that she's recently published, uh, which I don't really have any interest in reading. And I never would have picked this up if my sister didn't tell me I should read it. But I did do a try a chapter video with this. In terms of the plot, there's a Japanese television show that is interviewing people in the US. We have some characters from different walks of life and they're all going to kind of come together because of this TV show and the connections that it has between America and Japan. I read one chapter, okay? I was just barely starting to understand what was going on. I then have two books in the Vintage Anchor Emblem Canada editions. I have Eleanor Rigby by Douglas Copeland and uh, A Digging to America by Ann Tyler. The Eleanor Rigby book is is kind of weird from what I understand, but that is Douglas Copeland. He's a bit weird and wacky sometimes. I read a number of his books in high school and then kind of first, second year of university, and I feel like I've probably mostly grown out of his stuff at this point, but 
The book isn't very long, so I feel like it, it could be a good way for me to test the waters. With Digging to America, this isn't one that I would typically pick up, especially because I haven't really heard people talk about it, but because it was on sale with the other nice looking edition, I decided to pick it up. This is about two families that cross paths at the Baltimore airport, very different backgrounds, and how they end up striking up a friendship and what that means for the rest of their lives. This one is a chunker. It's been on my TBR for a really long time. And I've had it on my 10 books I wanna read for the upcoming year list at least once, maybe twice. Did I read it? No. The reason is because it's massive. And although I really do enjoy getting into a chunky book, I just, my mind is like, think of all the other books you could have finished in that time. And so it's just really hard for me to actually pick it up and get into it. This is one of the greatest Westerns ever written, Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. I've seen other people on booktube read this book and really enjoy it. So that's why it's still on the bookshelf here. I just need to not be so worried about missing out on other books when I take the time to read this one. I then have Washington Black by Essie Adugian. This was a finalist for the Man Booker Prize, which normally would be an immediate turnoff for me because me and Man Booker Prize books don't usually get along. But so many people were talking about this on booktube to the point where I was, when I saw this at either Goodwill or Value Village for $3, I was like, yes, I will be buying you. This is about a young slave, Washington Black, who gets chosen to go on this big adventure and sort of what happens on that adventure. And I thought that sounded like an interesting enough uh, premise, even if it is a Man Booker Prize finalist. We'll see. I then have The Light in the Ruins by Chris Bojalian. Chris Bojalian's an author that I've met a number of times because he was local to the area where I grew up and I have an autographed copy because my mom found this copy and got it for me for, I think for my birthday years ago. And I just, yeah, I haven't picked it up. This is a World War II historical fiction novel. I believe it takes place in Italy, so it involves a soldier and a woman. So there's going to be some romance in there. I've read other Chris Bojalian books before and I have enjoyed them. It's just been a while since I've read one, so hopefully I still like them as much as I've liked some of his other ones. This one is one of the oldest books on my TBR. I think it was in my first ever book haul video that I did on this channel, and that is The Passage by Justin and Cronin. Look at that cover, so pretty. This one is another massive one, which explains why it's been on here for so long, because once again, I'm intimidated about how long it's gonna take me to get through it. But there's some sort of security breach at a US government facility. And I, I always thought it was zombie apocalyptic-esque, but I've heard, I think people have mentioned it's, they're almost more like vampires in this. So yeah, this is actually the first book in a series, if I'm not mistaken, but I'll get to it someday. I still do, I still do have that feeling of wanting to read it. I just haven't done it. I then have The Historian by Elizabeth Kostova. This is another one that I've had for a really long time, but I did read the first chapter for a try a chapter video and I really liked it. This has really solid fall, creepy, sort of dark academia vibes and I, I'm into that. It's written sort of like the character in the book is telling you about her story and it ties in with Dracula and some other creepy stuff. So I'm all for it. I just need to pick it up in the right season. Speaking of academia, I have Special Topics in Calamity Physics by Marisha Pessel. This one doesn't sound as appealing to me as Night Film did, which is the book by her that I read previously and gave five stars, really enjoyed. This one is about a group of students at an elite school and there's a death and what happens with that, so worth a shot. This is a newer acquisition for me. We've got some can lit here. A Town Called Solace by Mary Lawson. I had heard a couple people talk about this on booktube, uh, but it was also a cover buy because that spine is beautiful and this cover is also really beautiful. This is about people living in a small town in I believe Northern Ontario and kind of how their lives get all intersected. This is another book that I've had for a very, very, very long time. House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I did a test read of this and I was still interested in checking it out. I know Kayla from Books and Lala did a whole readathon a couple years ago and so I know a lot of people read this at that time. I was not prepared to join that, like it, <laughs> it wasn't on my list of things to read at the time, which it would have been really good to read it then because this is an incredibly 
intimidating. But yes, I read the first little bit of it and I was still intrigued. So it is still here. This is about a house that is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And it's like three different people are, are you know, somebody made an original account and then other people went through and made additional notes. But I think it could be really cool if I put in the time to read it. Another long-standing entry on the TBR is Tana French's Faithful Place. This is a murder mystery book that is the third in the Dublin Murder Squad series. Each of these books focuses on a different member of the squad and so I've read the first two books. I really loved the first one. The second one I didn't care for as much and then this one's just been sitting on the shelves for years, for years and I think if I'm gonna read this I kind of need to reread the first two not so much because they are super connected but just because I want to get to that feeling that vibe again of being with this group of people and then I can also catch any of the little connections. I also have The Interestings by Meg Wolitzer. This was pretty much a cover by it's striped rainbow, like come on. This is about a group of kids that meet at a summer arts camp and then how their lives stay interconnected through the years. Les tried to read this book a few years ago and she said she couldn't really get into it so I said we should probably try and reread it together. Like it'll be a reread attempt for her and first time read for me but yeah so potential buddy read for us to give this one a shot. This is another one that has been on here for a super long time. 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami. <laughs> I've had people tell me to just give up and don't don't even bother with this book but I did read the first chapter in a bit. There's a man and a woman and it opens with the woman. She's in a taxi and the taxi driver is kind of explaining to her like, look at, look at the world around you and see where things don't line up. So one Q84, Q is the stand-in for a question mark. It's, you know, it's a take on 1984 to some degree, but it's kind of, you know, it's bigger than that. There's a lot more going on and how these two characters sort of come together to understand what is going on in this world that they live in. I then have two Europa editions. They're not related to each other, other than the fact that they're put together by the same publisher. The first is Elena Ferrante's My Brilliant Friend. This one has been all over booktube for years and years, and I found it on sale at the thrift store and figured that was the time to try this book out if I ever was going to. This takes place in Italy. It is translated. Uh, let's see if I can find the translator. Translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein. And this is about friendship, two women who grew up together. Then I also have The Elegance of the Hedgehog by Muriel Barbary. And I believe this one is also translated as well. I believe it was originally written in French. Yes, translated from the French by Alison Anderson. This is one that I do find a bit intimidating because I feel like it's gonna be a bit too highbrow for me, but it's still worth a shot because I did read the first little bit of it. It's about a girl who's incredibly intelligent for her age. She lives in an apartment complex and then there's also somebody who's like the doorman basically of the building who has you know a job that you wouldn't necessarily associate with really high intelligence but that person is also very intelligent. I think there's going to be a bond created between the two of them and just family dynamics, all that kind of stuff. Three stacks to go, let's keep at it. I have A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. This is a collection of short stories. This is one of the most highly regarded short story collections of all time. And I feel like Lucia Berlin is one of those people that didn't get the recognition she deserved when she was alive. I just heard enough different people talk about how great her short stories were that I figured it was worth picking up the book and giving him a shot. I then have American War by Omar El Akkad. This is a futuristic book that takes place in 2074 and it's how the American landscape has changed since then but it yes yeah, kind of a dystopian futuristic look. It's not going to be a positive book. Speaking of not very positive books, The Book of Edda by Meg Ellison. This is the second book in the Road to Nowhere series, is that what it's called? Yes, the Road to Nowhere series. The first book is the Book of the Unnamed Midwife, which was a fantastic book, debut. I gave it four and a half out of five. The only reason it didn't get a full five stars was just because there were some sort of writing things that irked me a little bit, but I feel like that could have been because it was a first, you know, debut book. This is the companion book. So it's another one in the series, but it follows different characters who I think you kind of hear about at the end 
of the first book. So when I read this, I'm gonna reread the book of the unnamed midwife just because it was so good and I want to be able to just jump right from the first book to the second one and stay in this world and kind of remember everything that happened. It was, it was so, so good. So I really hope this one is good too. I've heard that it's not quite as good, but still worth the read. The Nest by Cynthia Dapri Sweeney is a book that has a beautiful cover and a lot of people were talking about it on booktube at one point and so it was another one of those oh the book's only a few dollars I'm gonna buy it and try it out. This is another book about family dynamics. There's a bunch of siblings and I think they're all brought together for one reason or another and so you see those dynamics play out. This one's really popular right now, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. I read Andy Weir's first book years ago and did really enjoy it and so I was uh, really wanted to try this one out. His second book, Artemis, did not get as much buzz or as much positive buzz anyway, whereas this one kind of feels like The Martian. It has that same energy behind it. I do like books set in space and I believe this one is on my 10 books for 2023 list because I really do want to get to it this year. Spoonbenders by Daryl Gregory, which is about a family that have superpowers. I really like superpower books. I always did when I was younger. Not that I would read like Marvel comics and stuff, but just other books where people had abilities where they could manipulate the elements or read minds or be invisible. Just that kind of simplistic everyday people kind of thing, but they had extra powers. Maybe it was in a fantasy setting, maybe it was in a regular setting. So this seems like it is a family with superpowers, but it's more in a regular setting. And I thought that sounded like a cool premise. I have the Penguin Modern Classics edition of F. Scott Fitzgerald's Flappers and Philosophers, The Collected Short Stories. I really enjoyed The Great Gatsby when I read it. It's actually one of the few books that I've reread in my life because I'm not a huge rereader uh, and that was one that I reread much closer together than I normally do. Like those rereads that I talked about are books that I read years and years ago whereas I reread The Great Gatsby within like five years of originally reading it so that was pretty rare for me. I saw this uh, on sale somewhere and thought it would be a great buy one because I love the modern classics editions. I just really like the look of them, but also because it's F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald and I feel like you could have some really good short stories. The Shining Girls by Lauren Bukes. This is a creepy book, kind of a book, even though it doesn't quite look like it, it's the kind of book that you want to read in the fall. This one it has a final girl, someone who is the last survivor of some sort of devastating event, and then also a serial killer who can travel through time to some degree. Her books are, I read one other book by Lauren Bukes and it, it kind of messes with your head a bit, but it is creepy. So if you're into that kind of stuff, these these books are for you. Ah, uh, yeah, this one's still on my shelves because I can't get rid of it because I paid money for it. So I'm gonna have to read it at some point, but it's Robert Galbraith's Lethal White, which is the fourth book in the Cormoran Strike series. I read the first three books before JK Rowling went way down her turf road that she has been on for a couple of years now. And this one has been sitting on my shelves since then. And I can't quite bring myself to read it, but I also don't wanna get rid of it cause like I paid full price for it. So it's, it's going to stay here for a while until either I force myself to pick it up because I'm in the mood, actually in the mood for it, or I just officially just let go and get rid of it. Because I did really like the books in the Cormoran Strike series. I liked the way they were written. Uh, I, I enjoyed the plot lines of them. And so there is that side of it as well. But yeah, so it's going to stay for now. I just, it just feels a little weird. Lord. Lexicon by Max Berry is a random find. I hadn't really heard anybody talk about it when I originally got it and then I tried the first chapter of it semi recently and was like oh, I was into it. This one is about the power of words but to the point where if you say words a certain way or in a certain order things actually happen like physical things in the real world it's sort of like a take on the sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never hurt me, whatever, but in this case words actually do hurt you. This is one of my newest acquisitions, Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. This is one that was popping up all over booktube to the point where I was finally like, okay, okay, I'm gonna buy a copy of it. And it's about two fathers whose sons are gay and are murdered because uh, they are married to one another. And the fathers who have 
neither of them have had a good relationship with their sons, decide to team up and get revenge on the people who murdered their kids. So very dark premise and definitely a bit of like a dad macho wee book, but everybody I've seen talk about it has talked about how great it is, so I wanted to give it a shot. The Muse by Jessie Burton, which has a beautiful cover as her books usually do. This is a book that Les got me actually a number of years ago and it's a little bit on the bigger side so sorry Les that's why I haven't read it yet. I don't even remember exactly what this is about but it's historical fiction. Oh yeah there's the little note that Les wrote me. Historical fiction set in England and Spain. Art, mystery, intrigue is what she wrote on it. So I feel like that's a pretty good summation of what this is going to entail. I just, yeah, ugh, I do love this cover. I just need to get over the fact that it's a little thicker. Pretty Girls by Karen Slaughter. I have not read a Karen Slaughter book before, but I have heard many a person tell me how just dark they are. Like some of the most brutal, graphic, dark, murder mystery books you can possibly read and I wanted to test the waters with this one and see what I thought. I still haven't done that yet. There have been a couple times where I've pulled this book aside to potentially read in the fall October creepy season and it just doesn't end up getting read but I still do want to see if I can stand a Karen Slaughter book. We are on to the last pile. Thank you if you're still here. I have The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. This is another one that I've been feeling the pull to read more recently, just like The Queen of the Tearling, because it is fantasy and more, this one's probably even more high fantasy than the other one. This one is definitely an adult fantasy ex reading experience, but I did read the first chapter of this. And I think partly because it was just the right day when I read it, it was kind of cold outside. I was tucked under a blanket. The first scene is kind of taking place, there's an, in a tavern. And so I just felt really cozy and warm. It left me really re with a really positive feeling. And also because the other time that I've read recently, it's been years, it's been like 10 years, but I read all of the Song of Ice and Fire books that are published to this point in the main series uh, in these mass market paperback versions and it just brought me back to that time in my life where over like a year and a bit I read all of the books and so yeah I just I had a really like positive cozy reading experience with the first chapter or so of this and so I just, it's just, it's big. That's the problem, right? I then have The World According to Gar by John Irving. This is a book that I got from one of my coworkers when she was cleaning out her bookshelf. She just brought a big pile of books in and this is one of the ones that I took. I've read a John Irving book before, A Prayer for Owen Meany. I did not like it. It's one of those books where Les loves it and I really didn't like it, but I can't deny that it was well written in that way, right? Like John Irving can clearly write. And this is a book that I've heard of before from him. And when I saw it in my coworkers pile of books, I thought I'm willing to give John Irving another shot. This one is just following a man who is a writer and kind of the ups and downs of his life. As far as I know. This is a Penguin Drop Caps edition book. I have two others from this series on my shelves, but I've already read them. So this is the only one that I haven't got to yet. This is Butterfield 8 by John O'Hara. I remember when these books were all the rage on the internet. So many people had them. This one is a book that caused a bit of a stir when it was originally published. Uh, this takes place during the Great Depression and it's about a relationship between a respectable married man and a young woman and sort of the choices involved in that relationship that create a big butterfly effect. So yeah, I mean, it's part of the Drop Cap series. I'm going to read it at some point. It's just, yeah, I'd never heard of it before. So I guess that's kind of, kind of nice that a series like this could feature books that we're all very familiar with, but also introduce books that maybe have been lost to time. I have The Narrow Road to the Deep North by Richard Flanagan. Remember how I mentioned me and Man Booker Prize winners don't usually get along or any just anything nominated for the Man Booker? This is a Man Booker Prize winner, but because it's a World War II prisoner of war story, um, you know, fictionalized, but that's the kind of thing that I am very interested in. So this was one of those times where I picked up the book anyway, even though it might be a little bit difficult for me to read like it could be very very literary and me and very literary books are kind of eh, yeah but I feel like I've got enough in here like I do try 
I do try with them and sometimes they work out well. So hopefully this is one that will work out well. I then have The Black House by Peter May. This is a murder mystery book. My friend Rachel was getting rid of it and she will text me when she's getting rid of books and say, are you interested in any of these? I was interested in this one just because it's really good to have a sort of easy, easy murder mystery book to read. Something that you can jump in and out of, read by the pool when you're on vacation, read on the plane, and it's not going to be so, uh, it doesn't take your attention the way a literary fiction book might. So I figured this would be a perfect book to just have when need be. This one takes place in an island off of Scotland, and the inspector that goes to investigate this killing that happened is originally from the island, so not only are they trying to solve the murder, but they're also having to deal with all of this stuff from their past. Third to last, I have The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon. This is one that has been on my shelves for many, many years. The series, every time another book would get published, there'd be buzz again, and I'd think, oh, I should pick that up, and then I never do. It has intrigued me still. It sits there, I almost picked it up, last year at one point and then I didn't. So the, the calling is still there. This is urban fantasy as far as I know and it involves a woman who is working in the criminal underground and she has these abilities that people aren't supposed to have and so somebody finds out that she has this ability and that kind of kicks off the story. Oh, something like that. I'm sure many of you were like, uh, because <laughs> you've read this book and I'm doing a horrible job of guessing what it's about. but. It's still on here because the calling is still there. Second to last, I have Akin by Emma Donahue. I've read a number of Emma Donahue books now and I've really enjoyed all of them. Room is probably my ultimate favorite, but I really like The Pull of the Stars. And then I've also read The Wonder, which was good, uh, like four to five stars for all of her books. So this is another one that I just happened to see in Goodwill. And I was like, uh, yes, you're coming home with me. This one is about a man who finds out he has a great nephew. The nephew has to come stay with him because he has no one else and the two of them end up going to uh, the Mediterranean to do some family research and the bonding that occurs between the two of them during that time. I'm sure there will be some sort of family history secret that will be unearthed. And my final book for my fiction TBR is California by Eden Lepucky. I really love this cover because one, green is my favorite color, and it's a picture of trees just turned on their side. So yeah, I really love looking at this one. And this is a post-apocalyptic book that follows a uh, husband and wife who I believe the wife might be pregnant. Yes, they're terrified about raising a child by themselves, and so the two of them decide to find a community in this post-apocalyptic world, and of course, when you're an outsider coming into a community in that sort of environment, things can go very wrong very fast. This is a book that has been on my 10 books I want to read for a particular year, and I just didn't end up getting to it because it is a little bit thicker. But yeah, there's, this cover so beautiful. It still calls to me. It's definitely staying on this TBR. That is all of the books that are fiction books that I still need to read or reread that I own. And yeah, wow, that was a lot of filming. If you have read any of these books yourself, let me know what you thought of them down below. Tell me which ones I should prioritize. Are there any that I mentioned that you really don't think I should be reading? Because maybe I can do another try a chapter video. As always, all of our links are in the down bar. If you want to go check those out. Thank you, thank you, thank you all very much for watching this very long video. And I'll see you later.